Congress has demonstrated that growth throughout the course of the past 34 years and is now asking for mercy and the opportunity to prove to the board and to the society that rehabilitation is possible and that brokenness can be mended. Thank you. So uh, is it fair, so it's fair to say superintendent, uh, that's the equivalent, that's the warden of the facility that she's a prisoner at. Is that a fair statement? That is. And you fully support her commutation. Is that accurate? I do. In fact, we uh, tried to find a member of the DOC staff that opposed it or did not believe that Ms. Harris would deserve the opportunity to be have her sentence commuted and we weren't able to find any and uh, certainly someone who supervises the facility at which she's at strongly endorses the idea of a second chance for miss harris so um anyone else before yeah, we I, move on to the next speaker i i have some uh, questions yeah um so ma'am we you know we we've We've done a lot of time talking about this case on multiple occasions. Um, you know, wh one of the things that, and uh, that I think has come up in the past is that at times, you know, she has, and she said this that you know, in in our hearing the other day, she feels like she can't, you know, she has trouble kind of expressing herself, you know, regarding her you know, her remorse and how this has affected her and so forth. And, and that, you know, she even didn't know what else she could do, which, which I felt very sort of sympathetic for that, because I think I'm not sure what else she could do. And I, and I do personally believe this, is a, you know, as a meritorious case, do, do you have a sense having been with her and talking with her for a long time that maybe she's just not that expressive a person, you know? I can actually speak to that. Her and I have had quite a few conversations over probably the last two years um, during her interview process. And I think Ms. Harris is one of those inter individuals who's very introverted. And she has created a wall based on her history of rejection. Um, and that's how she kind of forms a level of protection around herself. Um, and it's difficult for her, it was initially, to see how people saw her as very rigid, it's very angry um, and it's very difficult. Um, however, she's really worked hard over the last year um, to let people see the, the other side of her. She is one of those individuals where you have to spend time getting to know her to understand there's a deeper her there. Um, she just is very protective and guarded out of concern that somebody may hurt her. However, she has turned that into the ability to give back to others and she is phenomenal at working with the ladies that are committed to our inpatient mental health unit and, and i think that's an important point to make that you know there are some people who have been traumatized as as she certainly was who can sort of like go into their shell you know go into sort of a shell um and appear to be you know distant and or angry but but maybe but maybe aren't and 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 that's really how i feel about mrs harris do you, do you think that's a, a a reasonable conclusion i do and i can attest for several years ago back in the 90s there was even an incident where miss harris was assaulted in the facility um, by a peer who threw scalding hot water on her and miss harris didn't assault the inmate Ms. Harris didn't respond. Ms. Harris walked away from the situation. Um, and I think that speaks volumes to who she is now. Um, she knows when there's an unsafe situation that she needs to retreat and get herself to a safe place. And she understands that not everybody may like who she is, but as long as she's doing the right thing, then she's doing the right thing. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on, on Dr. Williams' questions for a moment, um, if I may. Um, Henrietta Harris uh, did not enjoy the full support of the Department of Corrections in the review, and I'd like your thoughts on why that is. 
I can I can answer that because um, I had some conversations with the staff. Um, if you go back to her 2007 application where we looked at her for commutation, she at that time did have, I believe, unanimous support from the facility staff. Unfortunately, with the department, at times staff turn over, um, they promote, they move on, they retire. And sometimes staff don't know the, the individuals quite as well as probably is needed in this kind of vote, but that's the nature, unfortunately, of the job. Um, and some of the things that we talked about was, if you looked at the comments, was that they felt that she didn't like um, direction, she didn't take feedback well, um, and she questioned authority. Um, our conversation was, one of the things we're charged to do when they're incarcerated is to teach people who don't have the best coping skills how to ad advocate appropriately for themselves and address concerns that may impact them or the others around them. Um, we can't teach them to go through life as bobbleheads, for lack of a better term. They have to be able to function and make decisions on their own. And that's one of the things I tried to talk to staff about is that's our mission and what we do. 85% um, of people incarcerated go home, and our job is to make them better and better able to make decisions. And so I think that the staff who work with her now are somewhat different than the staff who worked with her then and would support what I'm telling you is that she is that person who has learned to advocate. Do you think that there's any, um, you know, like residual effect um, from the fact that, you know, when she escaped from prison for many years on her way out, uh, she really hurt a corrections officer. I think she, she slashed the corrections officer. Who, who still opposes this commutation. Do you think that that has some impact on their thinking? I, I realize I'm asking you to get into their minds, but I'm just, I'm asking you to give me your, your best uh, thoughts based on the situation. I don't think that impacts their decision in that if you look at Muncie at the time, Muncie had no fence, so she didn't, she walked away. Um, she was a postpartum mother with a small infant child. Um, and Muncie was structured in that the housing units were set up as housing. housing. Um, every unit had a kitchen. Every unit had a functioning laundry room. Um, and so all of the items that she had in her disposal, which may now be restricted, were commonplace items in the day. Um, they would cook their own meals. So I say that to say that she could have made the choice to pick up a knife um, and make a more concerted attack on the officer. Um, that was never her intent. Her intent was, to, and she was very honest about it to the officer at the time. She just wanted to get home to her son. And um, my last question uh, for you is, you know, we've spent a lot of time with Ms. Harris, as you know. Um, yeah. Ms. Harris herself uh, commented on the fact that you know, she thinks that we think she's angry. You know, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing the conversation that uh, that occurred. And um, I know Ms. Harris in the last year or so has undergone um, some additional anger management classes. Do you believe that, I realize she's completed them. So I'm not asking you to give me an administrative answer as to whether or not she's gone through the requisite number of hours. I'm asking in, in your opinion, do you think she satisfied it in a way that it has had an impact on her ability to control her anger? I do. I think it reinforced what she already knew, um, operating as a peer assistant. But I think she, through it, she learned the importance of um, expression um, and how her appearance speaks volumes to people and how they judge her um, and the importance of making that first good impression because oftentimes people fixate on that impression. Okay, thank you. Next, next up is John Bridges. Mr. Bridges, you're muted. Mr. Bridges. Mr. Bridges. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, now we can, yes. Okay, good morning each everyone, Attorney General, DA, and all departments, board. 
I am John Bridges, the uncle of Henrietta Harris. I have sent in some uh, a letter of encouragement and also a letter of hope that uh, Henrietta, over the past year, I know we kind of like had come up to the facility back in the day when her mother was still alive, which is my oldest sister, and I've been the youngest of the, the nine siblings. So as we grew up, I had spoke earlier that Henrietta is only about four or five years younger than I am, even though I'm her uncle. But we grew up together and got a whole lot of things together as children growing up in a close-knit family in the rural area of Georgia as we call the country. There was farm work that we've done, chores around the house that we were held accountable as we grew up. We celebrated a lot of days. We was definitely church-going children and a church-going family uh, all through the years growing up. As we kind of like moved into our teenage years, you know, jobs, assignments kind of come on board and people take different avenues to pursue and kind of separate. But uh, I don't want to belong to time in a long period, but I did want to introduce that portion. The thing that I really request in the board today as hope and repent of Henretta, realizing that she has an avenue, uh, have avenues in society to join, this is a family, very close-knit, if she be released on parole by this board, you know, I'm asking, you know, under what conditions, you know, that I can be a support base for her and her future endeavors, realizing that I do have a daughter, Stacia Bridges, she's probably sent in a letter as well, she's handicapped to the point of has a about with MS. She's disabled to walk, but she can talk and can see on a small scale. But Henretta has been very instrumental and in communicate to her and being a support base for her because they had similar conditions, Henretta being confined to the facility and my daughter being confined to the home. So they had kind of like came up where they would speak with each other. I know if the cases know that she had a the phone number, she kind of spoke with her on a daily basis. I don't know if think that goes on anymore. I don't know whether that got cut out or not. But the real thing, I'm trying to ask for this board to really consider giving her that second opportunity or an opportunity to re-enter into society and to be the person that she was in the past and is today capable of being with society. Because I know we can, we will have an advantage for her, things that she has capability of doing, being a teacher, being a mentor, uh, being a mother, being just all those things. You know, I've been her uncle. Uh, we are very still close-knit as we grew up years, many years ago. Uh, Mr. Bridges? Yeah. Mr. Bridges, uh, Ms. Harris's crime was, of a, the victim is a familial uh, crime, and you are a member of her family, correct? Correct. And you strongly support her given the, being given the opportunity to rejoin your family and have, have a second chance on the outside. Is that a fair statement, sir? Absolutely correct. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. The next uh, person is John Whitaker. Yes, good, good morning. Uh, my name is John Whitaker. I am uh, Henretta's first cousin, and I'm here to just show support for Henretta. Henretta is about 14 years old older than I am, and growing up, she was my caregiver. Not going to be long, but she was my caregiver uh, when my mom worked two jobs, and uh, she 
uh, she took me around and said that I was her son. But what I wanted to do is just show support for her. I'm, I'm retired military, did 26 years in the military. I serve as an assistant pastor at a church right now, work on a military base. And also I go to the road prison here and talk with the prisoners. And I just want to let you know that uh, I am more than willing to help Henretta. I have an extra room. I'm a proud father of seven daughters. Five have left the home, went to the, uh, graduated college, or went into the military. And I only have two kids at home, have spare bedroom, have all facilities she needs to help her get back on her feet, have an extra car for her. I just want to uh, show my support for her. And I've talked to her several times, lived there about 18 months ago. And I know God has really changed her life and touched her heart. And she has a heart of forgiveness now. And I just want to let you know she has family members that's willing to support her. And I live in Pensacola, work on the, the base at NES Pensacola. And I just wanted to uh, let you know that there's a, she got a support group out here that's willing to support her. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up is, is Debbie Bridges Herring. morning. I'm board member, board of pardon. Um, I am Henretta's younger cousin. Uh, I, as well, John is my brother, younger brother. So Henretta, um, my letter stated that she was uh, my very first babysitter, as well as mentor. I work, I am also retired military. I work now presently at the hospital here in my hometown. I relocated after returning home. But as a young teenager, because I live in rural South Georgia, we didn't have a lot of a youth development facility. I work a lot of, with children now and women that are transitioning back into society. And she was one of the very first, um, before mentoring was the end thing, she was a mentor for me. Um, growing up in South Georgia, we didn't have a lot of toys to play with, but... She introduced me to all of her older friends. She played basketball, all of the people within the community. Um, she made sure that we all were very disciplined. We were all taken care of. So to think of her as a protector, uh, I come from a very good family, a, a, um, a religious family. Um, but she was, um, she had the spirit of an older aunt, um, very mindful very conscientious of ensuring that the things that our elders, our parents, or our parents work, because they work the farm and other jobs, that we were, we were busy, we were accountable at home taking care of the things that we need to take care of. So um, definitely I will echo um, the sentiments of my brother as well being an assistant pastor here at my church. I work daily with women in transition um, with the mental health facility. I'm willing to provide as many resources, referrals, counseling, whatever needed, a place to stay, transportation, wherever she chooses. If the board should allow her this opportunity to transition back into society, we are going to embrace her um, with open arms readily to help her to try and recover some of the lost years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the next next up is somebody that's known to everyone on the board, and that's Naomi Blunt. And uh, she uh, is speaking as somebody who actually knows Ms. Harris uh, for how long. I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Naomi. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Naomi Blount Wilson, and I am a friend of Henrietta Harris. Um, and I hear everybody talking, and, and it's good that, you know, they say the wonderful things. But, you know, when you're on the inside, like we were on the inside together, no one really knows as well as we know each other. Um, I consider Henrietta as, as being a friend. Henrietta is so funny. And so even when I have heard, you know, uh, some talk about her being angry or, or displaying some type of anger, I, I really just could not understand that because she is so humorous. She is really, in, in my dark days, 
I could always go to Henrietta and she could make light of a situation and, and make me laugh and make me forget about feeling bad. She just has that kind of spirit. Um, I play um, uh, music at the, uh, at the chapel in the institution and every Sunday when Henry would come to church, she would always go to the altar and kneel down and pray. Everybody didn't do that, but she would always go to the altar and kneel down and pray. And every time she would get up, she would always have tears in her eyes. I knew that she just, you know, had like a heavy heart. Um, she's a good person. She always got, um, in fact, she lives in the honor uh, unit right now. But um, before then, I mean, she always got honor jobs. Like she worked in the visiting room. They don't put everybody in the visiting room. The superintendent is there. She can tell you that. They, it's a select few that can go in the visiting room. They want good personalities, uh, uh, people that know how to talk to other people, people that are just friendly. Well, Henrietta fitted that criteria, and that is how she got that job in the visiting room. Now, so, um, Naomi, is it is it fair to say, given that you've known her for decades, and that you also were afforded a second chance yourself, the stakes being so I just want to ask you directly, do you, is there any concern on your part that Naomi, uh, or Naomi, that, that if Henrietta was given a second chance, that she would go out and re-offend in a violent manner in, in any way? No, no, no way, no way ever, no way. Henrietta is a good person, a very good person. Henrietta, she expresses remorse for, for why she was in prison. I'm telling you, if Henrietta were to be released, and I'm praying that this board releases Henrietta, you will never hear anything but good things about her. She is just a good person who just loves her children, who mothered her children from the inside, which is very hard to do. And um, she's a good person. She is more than deserving, more than deserving. Th thank you, Naomi. Uh, next uh, up uh, is Celeste Trusty. Good afternoon, honorable members of the board. My name is Celeste Trusty, and I'm a longtime advocate for the incarcerated and for criminal justice reform in Pennsylvania. I'm here in my personal capacity today to speak in support of Ms. Henrietta Harris's application for clemency. Pennsylvania's sentencing laws favor retribution and punishment in response to harm, but we lack adequate mechanisms for relief and mercy when sentences are unjust, excessive, or even unnecessary. Because we lack these appropriate pathways to relief based on age or medical necessity, clemency is a crucial process in the Commonwealth that's really the only pathway toward mercy and relief for people serving these sentences. Ms. Harris was given a mandatory life sentence for a mistake made at the young age of 21, but like we all had, Ms. Harris has grown and matured during her adulthood. Ms. Harris is now 63 years old and has served over 40 years in prison, serving as a tutor for incarcerated scholars at SEI Muncie, helping her fellow residents, and remaining misconduct-free for the last two decades. Ms. Harris, like so many other people languishing in Pennsylvania's prisons, would be a leader and a mentor in her home community if given a second chance at freedom. Those lucky enough to know Ms. Harris speak so highly of her character, positive outlook, and eagerness to help others. Even many people who are charged with supervising Ms. Harris during her daily life inside her prison facility support her clemency efforts. Pennsylvania proudly boasts the ideals of virtue, liberty, and independence. Virtue means moral excellence, of which Ms. Harris has been successful at achieving. Ms. Harris has lived the last 23 years of her incarceration misconduct free and has resided on the honor block at her facility for more than a decade. Liberty means freedom. Ms. Harris has already served 41 years in prison for a mistake made at the young age of 21, and she has used her time in prison to mentor others. Independence means being free from the control of others, and Ms. Harris is coming before the board after more than four decades of imprisonment, begging you to support her freedom from endless incarceration. Like Ms. Harris and so many other people before you, the board has the opportunity and the responsibility to exemplify these values that our Commonwealth holds so sacred by supporting the applications of people asking for mercy. Pennsylvania and its leaders should strive toward moral excellence by supporting second chances, should work to promote liberty by supporting the true freedom of the many people unnecessarily stuck inside our prison system, and promote independence by supporting the release of people serving sentences of unending in supporting clemency for people like Ms. Henrietta Harris, the board can also help address the historically disproportionate harm done to black communities and communities of color by our excessively punitive sentencing laws and lack of second chances. Pennsylvania's approach to sentencing is not only wasteful, but it separates families like the Harris family, it exacerbates and perpetuates racial disparities, 
that deprives people who have made mistakes of nearly any opportunity for mercy. The board can take action to remedy this in their capacity by supporting the applications of people coming before you, including Ms. Harris. Henrietta Harris should not die in prison, and I humbly ask each board member to support funding for Ms. Harris. Thank you, Ms. Trustee. Uh, I briefly want to acknowledge the district attorney's office, and it, it has been known that you, your office has consistently supported commutation for Ms. Harris. Is that is that accurate? That is true. Uh, accurate. Okay. Thank you. Uh, two minute transition to the next case. Thank you. I, I want to. We're moving on to the case of Michael Rinaldi, and. I want to thank you all for joining us. We have an unusually large number of family members that would like to speak, presumably in opposition to this case. And due to the time constraints, uh, we would just very respectfully ask that, that you limit your comments to two to four minutes, please, uh, to make sure that everyone is afforded the chance to, to speak their, their, their mind. And I want to start things off to the superintendent and deputy superintendent of the facility, which Mr. Rinaldi is incarcerated. We had the pleasure of speaking with them at length uh, during the course of Mr. Rinaldi's interview. And gentlemen, is it safe to assume that you enthusiastically support Mr. Rinaldi's chance at commutation? Definitely yes, we definitely support Mr. Rinaldi. That is correct. Does does the board have any questions uh, again of the uh, the superintendent or deputy superintendent? Uh, I, I I do actually, um, and uh, there there were a number of uh, number of uh, data points uh, that I, that I was looking for that do not appear to be present uh, in terms of evaluations and so forth so I won't go into those now but if we could just offline <laughs> if I could uh, you know sp speak with Dr. Malashek or whomever else uh, regarding those that would be great what was that a is that a statement? It was a statement, yes. I would like to... Oh, so you, don't, so you don't have any questions? I just wanted to alert the department, you know, regarding my need for additional data in this case. Yes, okay. All right. Harris, you have questions? No, I do not. Okay. All right. All right. Moving on to the victims. First, first up is Joanna Adams. Donna. Donna, you want to take okay. Donna. Donna. Hi. Good afternoon. Donna Adams, yes. Okay. okay, hi. I'm sorry. I'm Donna's aunt. Um, John is here, but she's very upset and nervous right now. Okay. We pass on Donna. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. What? It's okay. Right. Okay, the next the next is Renata Volpe. Yes, she's coming up. Hi, guys. I'm sorry. I'm very nervous to talk also. I'm just going to pull up my uh, what I had written to the board because I'd like to read that first and foremost. On May 19, 1980, 21-year-old Edward Biancoli was brutally murdered by Michael Rinaldi. His crime was so depraved and violent that he was given a life sentence. We, as Edward Biancoli's family, are very confused how and why, despite the court sentencing him to serve life in prison, despite his unwillingness to take responsibility for murdering our dear brother, 
shooting him five times in the back. The first shot that went off, allowing our brother to turn and look at him and continue to shoot him four more times, leaving him for seven long months in Tinnicum Township, where he was so-called friend from grade school, all the while assuring our mother, who was worried sick where her missing son was. Michael Rinaldi told her he was in Florida with the girl and would be back soon. Knowing he had brutally murdered him, he worked side by side with our sister Clorinda Biancoli after murdering our brother and tormented and threatened her daily until he was finally arrested. Never has he shown any remorse for his crime. Edward's family should never be made to relive this horrible crime every few years when there is a parole hearing. The Biancoli family continues to suffer unnecessarily on Michael Rinaldi's account and we are re-victimized every time he is eligible for parole. Rinaldi also possesses a serious danger to community and Manas must not be released into society. He must remain in prison. And I hereby urge the Pennsylvania Parole Board to deny Michael Rinaldi's request for parole and force him to serve out his remainder of his life sentence. If he is given a future parole date, I ask this parole board to use its discretionary power to set the state for at least 35 years from now, maximizing the chance that he will remain in prison for the rest of his life and never again pose a threat to society. Please deny Michael Rinaldi's parole request. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The, the next speaker is Frankie Klein. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, board. Good afternoon. I am uh, Edward's younger sister, and I am now 58 years old. On May 19, 1980, I saw my brother Eddie in the early evening. And if I, I would have known it was the last time I would have seen him, I would have told him I loved him. Our lives were never the same from that night. We went insane, the entire family, looking for him. But in our mom's heart, she knew something was very wrong because Eddie was not the type of guy who would never come home. I'm not here to paint a picture of my brother being a South Philly young guy as an angel, because he wasn't, we were all did it. But he did not deserve to be killed. And he did not deserve to be called a gruesome sight on Channel 6 News. <laughs> and to be identified by his sneakers while Michael Bernaldi was out eating and working and partying and show no empathy whatsoever for any of us. He came into my mother's home and he put his hand on her shoulder and he told my mother, I will be home soon. Every rumor my mother followed up with knowing in her heart it wasn't Eddie. And every night, every evening when that phone rang and it was the morgue and our father and our oldest brother, Anthony, had to go and see if it was him. And it was like forever for them to come home. I was 18 years old. He was 21. He just got license legal to live life. This is Eddie. A heart as big as the world, <laughs> a kind, beautiful soul, handsome, <laughs> just to be called a gruesome sight.
in the eye. He looked him in the eyes and he continued to shoot him. We laid every night, every day, visualizing me alone. While we waited and knew in our hearts something was wrong. He couldn't drop a letter to our mother. Put a note in the mail. Have some empathy. He was seen many, many nights in a nightclub. Partying and having dinner and enjoying his family and his job at the casino. That's not fair. That's not fair. God don't like ugly. God does not like ugly. So with that, I beg you, please think about this and consider keeping him in there. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, thank you. Um, Thank you for your words. Um, I'd like to ask a question if I... Ma'am, are you, are you willing to answer a question? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm Attorney General Absolutely. Josh Shapiro. I'm Attorney General Josh Shapiro. I have the opportunity Good. to um, question Mr. Rinaldi at length last night. And one of the questions that I asked repeatedly was about how he took advantage of the friendship, the relationship that he had with your brother to lure him into the situation where he was killed. The record indicates that in the days following the killing, the week, I should say, that had a lot of engagement with the family, with your family. The dinners were had, um, that uh, he, he made comments to the effect that, um, don't worry, your, your brother's going to be fine, he'll, he'll be alive, we'll find him, things to that, to that effect. And he referenced um, engagement with a sister, um, and I, I I'm assuming that you're the sister uh, here. And uh, and if you're not the sister, I'm happy to, you know, direct this question at person. But here's, here's my question. Yes. yes. Mr. Rinaldi said that he had no direct contact whatsoever in the weeks after the killing, that he did not have dinner uh, with members of your family, that he did not offer any comforting words to them. And that the, the records that, you know, that, that we have, that we pour over, that we spend a great deal of time reviewing, um, are not accurate. And so given the fact that you and other family members are here, I'd like uh, either you or someone else to just recount what occurred in the, in the weeks following the killing. And I know this is emotional, and I'm sorry to ask you to go through this, um, but this is an important factor for me and I know other board members in trying to understand what occurred after the killing and, and the manner in which your family was uh, engaged. Thank you for, for your courage. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, We're having a little, can you hear me attorney general? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. I muted myself so we could hear you. You're good to go. You speak. Go ahead. So sorry. I'm sorry. Um, no, Michael Rinaldi did not ever have dinner at our home after the killings. I don't know where that came from. Prior to him killing my brother, Michael was always at our home with Eddie. Um, but he did come to our home and he did put his hand on my mother's shoulder and he told my mom that Eddie will be home soon. He did. Now, anything else after the murder, he did not come anywhere near us except that one time. One time he came to my mom's house. But we never, I never seen him again because I was in Philadelphia. Our oldest sister, Clorinda, she seen him all the time because she was down the shore working as well as in the casino. 
but I never, I only saw him when he came to my mom's home. But that was it. Okay. Yes. I, I appreciate that clarification. I see Miss Grayson nodding um, because I think she realizes I, I may be conflating the two sisters here in, um, in, in this. And I apologize for that. It's hard to follow, particularly on a Zoom screen. Um, but there was a there was a lot of discussion about um, contact with the sister down in Atlantic City or somewhere down the shore at nightclub yeah. things like that. Um, is anyone able to to speak to that? Yes, yeah, she's here. Our sister's here. She's she would love to talk to you. Yes, please. Well, I'll tell you what. I I'm gonna. The lieutenant governor has an order in which he's going through things. So, uh, yeah. well, is that is that Clorinda, the sister yeah. that you referenced? Yeah, yeah. she's yeah. actually next. So why don't we just put her on okay. right now? Yes. Okay. okay, she's next on Thank the you. list. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank Hi. you, and be safe. Thank you. Hello, hello. Anyone you might be on you from that. Josh, you want to ask her? Yeah, yeah, this is, is this Clarinda? I'm, I'm Clarinda Biancoli. I am Clarinda. Edna Biancoli's oldest sister. How are you? I'm good. And Clarinda, I, I don't want to stop you from saying whatever you wanted to say. Um, I would hope that as you talk to the board, you, you would be able to address the questions that I just raised your other sister. I apologize that I had confused the two of you. That's okay. But That's I think based on what I was asking, and I would appreciate in your comments if you could address that. I'm going to put myself on mute so we can hear you. Okay. So you want me to start from when we became engaged down the shore together. We worked in a casino. I want you to say whatever is on your mind. I would just okay. like to answer my question as to what occurred uh, between Mr. Rinaldi and you and your family in the time after the killing. Okay. I went down to the shore, as so did he. We both applied at Bally Park Place Casino for a job. My brother was already killed at that time. So you could just imagine I had just gotten the job, and so had he. And he was a crap stealer, and I was a cocktail waitress. And every night, I would ask him, please, do you know where my brother is? Do you know where my brother is? Relentlessly asking him, please, Michael, is there anything you can tell the family? You were his friends. Do you know anything? And he was very, very nice to me said to me, no, he'll be all right, things are going to be okay, he'll show up, and as time went on, I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable with what he was telling me, I just wasn't comfortable, so we would go to clubs, I would see him, and he would be dancing, and he would be just having a grand old time, knowing that my brother was laying in a ditch behind the old airport where he left him and he would be in these clubs doing everything that you and me would be doing. And I would sit there and I would just look at him knowing that I knew something wasn't right until one day he approached me and told me to get the fuck out of his life he is to never see me, or I am to never ask him. He flicked a lit, lit, lit cigarette in my face. Friends and myself left the nightclub, and that's how it ended, until he was arrested at the Tropicana Casino, because that's where it transferred. If, if I may just continue, last night, um, we spent a lot of time with Mr. Rinaldi, uh, and, and had a lot of questions. I asked him a number of questions about his interactions with you after the killing. And he indicated that there were uh, a couple, a handful of times where he saw you at a nightclub down the shore, 
but it was like from across the room that there really yeah. was not any direct engagement, that there was not any direct conversation. What you're saying today it directly contradicts Hello? that. Are you sure you had those conversations with him? Are you sure that he assured you that your brother would be fine? Many, many occasions. If the crap table was here and he was pushing the stick and I was serving the people, it was very easy for me to speak with him on a dead game when there was no one there and ask him, Michael. And at that point, I really believed in my heart that Michael uh, didn't know, but I maybe, at some reason, can reach him to see. Maybe you can find out what's wrong with my brother. Maybe, Michael, you know, you know. Did you hear something? Philly's small. I'm down the shore. Uh, please, please, to the point, I think I annoyed him so very bad that in the nightclub, he came up to me and he flicked the cigarette in my eye and told me that I was never to ask him again where my brother was and to stay the fuck out of his life. And I never saw Michael Rinaldi until we went to the Tropicana because we knew he was going to be arrested. And my family and I stayed back, never uttered a word, and they went into the pit and had him arrested and okay. took him off the casino floor. And, and just my last question on this, and, and I'm sorry if you think that this is kind of nitpicky, but this is an important... That's okay. Um, your other sister had indicated that Rinaldi had some communication with your mother, yeah. and assuring her everything would be okay. That happened roughly at the same time that these interactions with you were occurring at the shore? No. No, I had been down the shore. He had been down the shore. There might have been a time when he came up from the shore to visit with my mother it was, and to... It was months, um, months, months ahead, but if they're ready, right. then. That he but came, he was a right. Right, he came, and then he said to mommy, he'll be home soon, and then mommy went to... The, the so, yeah. He, right, the bottom line is, after your brother was killed... Yes. You had multiple conversations with Rinaldi where he assured you, you know, he didn't know anything, everything would be okay. Your mother had at least one conversation. Yes, but our conversations weren't lengthy. It was like brief. I, I, I don't know. At first they were like, no, it'll be okay. Never patted me, never touched me. No, it'll be okay. One word answers, two word answers. Right, it'll be okay. Conversations. I, I understand. I understand. Okay. 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 I, I realize I've asked you questions. If, if there was something else you wanted to say or focus on, please feel free. But okay. thank you for answering my questions. I appreciate that. Okay, so I there is some things I, I'd like to say. One being that I love and miss my brother every single day of my life. There isn't a day that goes by that my family is not tormented by this ordeal. I'm a little confused as why I'm here. Um, when Michael Rinaldi was sentenced, he was sentenced by Judge McGovern for the rest of his natural life. So it gave us some kind of small, little, tiny, minute peace of mind to think that this man, the crime that he committed, the punishment fit, fit the crime, fit it all and that we would be able to somehow move on. But it was very rough for us to lay down in bed every night and imagine a beautiful, beautiful human being being gnawed, being gnawed and picked at by every rat and rodent that walked by his way. And I want you to try to picture that in your mind, someone that you love. And I, that I think, I couldn't picture my brother looking like this. I couldn't picture my brother being the beautiful boy that he was. And I couldn't picture um, all the good things. I couldn't remember everything, nothing. I just could remember not sleeping 
not being able, my family all in a disarray, my mother dying a slow, slow death, very slow. And I never remember anything but this awful. And the one thing I can't remember that, that I could remember, I'm sorry, that how a human being, how a human being can take another human being and leave him there. How could he leave him there and go on and go on? You know, people take nerv nervous breakdowns. They go, they're not able to hold jobs. They get skinny. They go to somebody. They took this. I, you know how I know? Because I worked with them. And I saw the interaction with other people. This man never showed an ounce of remorse for what he did. And I saw it. I was a witness to it. And I cannot for the life of me. I was in my 20s when my brother was killed. I am now in my 60s. And I still cannot picture my brother. And I want my brother here. I want him at our dinner tables, just like all the other people you heard. And I wanted to meet his nephews and his nieces. And I want to know what he would have been like. And you know what, to be honest with you, we're in prison. We haven't gotten out of prison. I'm right along with my Grenadi. I live in my own inside prison for all these years. All these years, it's, it's, I don't care how many years, it doesn't stop. To, my mind won't shut down. You leave a human being. I stopped in the middle of the street last week, and I picked a turtle up. And I brought the turtle to the corner. How do you leave a human being and go on with your life? That's the part I'm trying to grasp. I'm the one who had to go see the psychiatrist because I didn't understand how did he leave him there? How did he leave my brother there? Close your eyes and picture somebody that you love so much. Everybody is picking rats and roaches or picking at his beautiful everything. And I'm sorry, this is a very gloomy conversation, but there's no other way around it. There's no other way for me to let you know how bad this has affected our family. Terrible, terrible. And, in, and, and every time Mr. Rinaldi has come up, I have letters here, and I, I'm sure you do. And in one of his letters, or maybe some of them, or maybe the very last one, he only makes remarks about what he wants to do. I never hear him say, I'm sorry for what I did to the young boy. I have remorse. He could have said it to you, which is good. That's good. We're, we're the ones. We're the ones that need to be told. Not that I would want to let want him go, but it's some consolation to know that you left my beautiful brother, but you're, you feel really bad. Never has he once, never. So I guess I'm going to tell you that, um, I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. I really do. I want you to try and understand that there's nothing out here for him. He was involved in more than one murder. He was involved in other things. 